Hi, Dan. Hi, Bob. How are you doing? We're doing well. You're catching me in the middle of, uh, I guess, like my books. Uh, uh, I, I show, I show the full mess. You're uh, you're catching me in the full mess of holiday break with my three year old, so the apartment's in shambles. But I'm I'm happy to be talking to you. I bet it gets worse than this, doesn't it? This can't be the worst it ever is. Oh no no no! Yes, it gets way worse. Yeah. Okay. So we will extrapolate. Um. Well, let me introduce this. I'm Robert Wright. This is the Wright Show, available on both streaming video and audio podcasts. You are Dan Harris. You barely need an introduction. I mean, if anyone turns on the TV, you know, at any given on any given day, there's a pretty good chance of seeing you. You work seven days a week, right, for ABC News? Is that true? Probably six, six days at, at, at a minimum, often okay. seven days, yes. Okay. So one of those is uh, Weekend Good Morning America, and, and five of those are Nightline, your co-host on both? Yeah, sometimes I can get away with just working four days on Nightline, but yes. But this is not the reason we're talking to you. Not the only reason. Uh, as if it weren't enough to work as hard as you do as a broadcast journalist, you... Uh, Write uh, books on meditation, including, including the famous bestseller, 10% Happier. And uh, the book published just this week uh, looks like this, for those watching on video. A kind of a sequel, uh, Meditation for Fidgety Skeptics. It's a, it's kind of a how-to meditation book. By the way, for those of us who can see, those our video audience should know that this is your son, uh, <laughs> uh, he's the one with blonde hair. You're the one with darker hair. Yeah, he he's uh, he looks like the sort of Aryan version of me. Right. Uh, you're the one who meditates. You're the one who needs to meditate. Yeah, he's very much in the moment, but probably more like a, a Labrador retriever than a uh, meditator. Yeah, this is a famous uh, Joseph Goldstein line, right? Yes. Joseph is your is your teacher, your main yeah. your main teacher, your main meditation teacher, famous. Famous guy, Joseph Goldstein, and he distinguishes between the kind of mindfulness we're after, the kind of being in the moment we're after with mindfulness meditation, and the kind of being in the moment that comes naturally to a, a Labrador retriever. Yes, yeah. Like, uh, as he says, you know, I, I think being present is necessary but not sufficient for mindfulness. Right. So a Labrador retriever, or well, let's just say my son, my, my son's probably – is is present but not mindful, you know, every time he poops his pants or something like that. But right. but but mindfulness involves a certain amount of metacognition, knowing that you know. Right. Uh, and that is not there in most of the time for three year olds or laboratory mm -hmm. And uh, so this book I, I have to thank you because I it solved a problem for me. I uh, ever since I wrote a book on Buddhist meditation, I've occasionally been asked like what's a good kind of how to meditate book? And I never know what to recommend, but this, this is the book. Well, thank you. Uh, I appreciate that. And I don't know if you how far you got in it, but you might see that I, at the end of the book, recommend a bunch of books for people to do further reading. Your book is the first I, on. I saw that. I saw. I discovered that yesterday as I was approaching the end of the book, and I was I I was deeply grateful and gratified. I I your book is fantastic. Uh, I hope we'll get into just sort of talking about it because and and you've. Uh, I, uh, you may have announced this to your audience before, but you've been on my podcast, and and uh, yeah, but your book I think really it, <laughs> solved a problem for me because I tell people I'm a Buddhist, and that makes people uncomfortable. Uh, and when I can point to your book, it actually uh, people are like, oh, okay, I, this guy's a Buddhist too. That makes me feel fine. <laughs> okay, well, so we solved each other's problems. Yeah. Uh, and but but I don't think we should end the conversation here, even though um, we could. We're we're both good. I think we should explain to people what's so amazing about your book. Sure, I'm always happy to do so, that. No, here's I, I really think I was thinking about this, like what exactly you're pulling off here. And I think part of it is this: you first of all, you it's not a one size fits all book, which is important because different people have different problems with meditating. And maybe we should first say who exactly this is for. I, 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 it kind of ranges from people who uh, have heard enough to be intrigued about meditation and think there might be something there, but have never tried it and think they have a reason for not trying it. And it but it includes people who have tried it and it just hasn't worked. And I would say for that matter, it, it would be useful for people who, who just who barely heard anything about meditation, but I think it's those first two groups I named that are kind of the target audience. Is that right? Yeah. Um, I always picture every time I write a book, uh, <clears throat> a man or woman 
he was extremely busy uh, and works in a competitive industry and is at an airport feeling vaguely stressed, but maybe not even knowing it, and walks by a big pile of books and sees a title that catches his or her eye. I think about me before meditation. Okay. Uh, and uh, that person may have heard of meditation or, or have considered it for him or herself or not, but seeing the title gets the initial spark of interest. Yeah. And for, 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 for me, the, the big initial insight was um, something incredibly obvious, which is that we all have minds and are thinking. And when you're unaware of the nonstop conversation in your head, it owns you. Mm-hmm. And I had never had that pointed out to me before, even though it's incredibly obvious. Yeah. And uh, once that was pointed out to me, I just it just all of a sudden this really often quite noxious pageant that is playing out in my head and had been since I, since sentience uh, was revealed to me, and I could see some of the many ways in which um, I had been a complete moron. And the the further you investigate, the more you see, and the less of a moron you become. Right. And this, now some of this was, was uh, laid out in, in your, your first book, 10% Happier, uh, which is mega, mega bestseller, uh, and very entertainingly laid out, which is one reason it was a bestseller, I think. Um <clears throat> It's uh, and that sets up this book. Both of those books, uh, both the books, I think, are impressive for having a kind of a narrative drive. And the reason I think that's so important here is because I think a problem you solved is this. It gets back to this the fact that it's not a one size fits all approach. There are people, there are people who teach meditation more like one size fits all. It's like yeah. you have to do it exactly like this. Follow the path I followed. Uh, y- you don't do that. Um, there, you know, if this doesn't work, try this. If this doesn't work, try this. The challenge of that is that, you know, if, if you if if you're if you're throwing out different things that work for different people or addressing different challenges that different people have, uh, you might worry about losing some of your audience that's not having that particular challenge. This just isn't their issue. But you you, you solve that problem, and I think it's uh, partly through the fact that you turn it into a narrative. And the way you do that is you you introduce this uh, meditation teacher. who's actually your co-author, Jeff Warren, for whom you have a lot of respect. And uh, you actually, you know, it's 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 kind of a dialogue almost. I mean, he, he his contributions are in a separate font, and he does more of the hands-on how-to stuff. Uh, but as if that weren't enough, you you two actually went on this adventure together. Right, which which is the backdrop for the book. You you like declared yourself rock stars. Is that an unkind way of putting it? Uh, no, no, no. I mean, well, I, I mean, yeah. you had a bus. You had a bus. We had a rock star bus that was previously used by Parliament Funkadelic, and we pr- pronounced ourselves to be the most boring people who ever used the bus. And then you to- you went around the country, uh, setting up in some places. You'd set up a meditation uh, booth and accost passersby. Uh, and uh, and then you uh, you also had groups you were planning to visit, right? Cops and so on. Uh, and but it all works. It's really it's really impressive. Uh, and there's like a ton of useful information. So what are the like what are the biggest obstacles you think you're helping people get over? What are the most common common challenges you run into? Well, let me just amplify amplify one point you made. Uh, well, first of all, thank you for everything, all the nice things you just said. I really appreciate it. This, I'm, as we record this, it's I'm one day post publication, so I actually haven't spoken to to many other human beings who've actually read the book. So, and I'll be honest, I have struggled with the fear that I'm still not, I have still haven't fully vanquished that we we were trying to make a very tough putt here because. I wanted to do three things in the book. I wanted to teach people how to meditate. I wanted to systematically taxonomize all of the various obstacles to meditation. And I wanted to uh, tell a funny story. <clears throat> That's a lot to ask for. And I, there were two voices in the book with my voice as the storyteller and Jeff as the pedagogical voice. And I've spent a lot of time trying to make sure the thing and basically 2017 was swallowed by this book. And, uh, 
you, you know, uh, there, I'm pretty confident there aren't other how to meditate books out there like this, but there may be a reason for that. <laughs> and so that, that's what I've been wrestling with for a while. Um, and then the, the, the due date arrived and here we are. Um, the, but to answer the actual, the question you actually asked me, I think there are two principal obstacles that people have to meditation. One is, um, uh, that they fear they don't have time for meditation. It's just another thing on the to-do list, which further stresses them out, which is ironic because this is supposed to uh, mitigate stress. And this, and the other is, uh, this misconception, this, in- this incredibly widely held misconception that meditation entails clearing the mind, which is, of course, impossible. As I like to say, it's impossible unless you're enlightened or dead. Uh, so uh, those are the two piggies that we that we encountered early on in our road trip across the country, but there are maybe six others that we also found. Okay. The, uh, the clearing the mind thing is an interesting one. How did that get started? I mean, maybe it's like, it's got kind of a Zen flavor to it, I guess. I mean, the misconception, it's not, I'm not saying it's what Zen teaches, but, but it's got a little bit of a Zen vibe. And maybe it's the fact that the concept of emptiness is associated with Buddhism, although that doesn't mean clearing the mind. Why, why, why do you hear this so much? Uh, you know, as I write in the book, I think that meditation has been the victim of the worst marketing campaign for anything ever. And I think it often has to do with the sort of fetishization of the East in the West, the way we present Eastern spirituality, often with a lot of pan flutes and with robed gurus addressing their disciples as grasshopper and um, uh, Yoda and all the, all the Buddha statues that are at this airport spas uh, with with the faces on the looks of the meditators with these beatific looks on their faces like they're floating off into the cosmos. And that has given people the impression that you, unless you're enveloped in a big bliss bubble when you sit to meditate, that you are doing it wrong. But in fact, the practice of meditation is this uh, what I call bicep curl for the brain and the mind, where you are trying to pay attention to one thing at a time, which is usually your breath, although uh, you have written about meditating to sound, but it, so it really can be anything. Uh, usually we start with something very basic like sound or the body sensations or the breath. And then when you get distracted, you start again and again and again. And people think, <laughs> they think, uh, pun not intended, that when they get distracted, that that is a failure, but in fact, actually, that is a victory, and it's a victory of real consequence, because it's in the moment when you see how crazy you are, the zoo in your head, that you then uh, are taking steps toward not being governed by the aforementioned craziness. You see, oh, well, this is what distraction is like. This is what anger is like. This is what hatred is like, et cetera, et cetera, and getting to know what your life is actually about, getting to know your, the contents of your consciousness and how they play out in your body. Uh, that is what allows you when you're ambushed by anger during the rest of your life in a conversation with your boss, your spouse, your child, that allows you to ride that out and not be yanked around by it. Yeah. And maybe we should pause and talk a little more about what it can do for you, even though um, that's not the main point of the book. And you did cover that to some extent in, in your last book. But what but talk a little more about what you're working toward. And, you know, feel free to use yourself as an example, because one thing I admire about you is the way you do in the book. Um, you know, you depict yourself as borderline crazy. Um, you say you, you had this grandfather, uh, Robert Johnson, right? Which I think is also yeah. the name of a famous musician, maybe. But uh, maybe, I'm con- maybe I'm confused. Anyway, that's not him. This is the crazy Robert Johnson, the one who is your grandfather. You seem yes. to think you inherited uh, from him a tendency toward... Uh, Toward paranoia and 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 rage and stuff like that and, and nursing grudges, um, and you know I have a question. Is like I, I you, you when you describe yourself, you sound like me. My question is: Are we the only two people that's crazy? Or are we just the only people who talk about it? And that's kind of a serious question. I mean, isn't everyone a little crazier than they than than they let on? Uh, absolutely. I mean, you can't. You know, you can't. You can't look inside in the process of meditation without seeing that you're crazy. I've never met anybody who's done any significant amount of meditation who hasn't come to that conclusion 
pretty quickly. It is often the first big insight, by which I mean you arrive at it within seconds of the first time you meditate. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a very useful insight. Uh, it's humbling in the best possible ways, in my in my opinion. Uh, and it is the first step toward uh, being less crazy. Right. It's like, I mean, a common formulation of an insight you have in yourself through meditating begins, I can't believe how much time I spend doing blank. Right? It's like, I was on a meditation retreat once and I just realized, I can't believe how much time I spend worrying about what people think of me. These yeah. people don't know me. I'm not talking to them. And yet I'm still self-conscious. This is crazy. And and but it could be anything. It could be how much time I spend in revenge fantasies or whatever. But you do have to step outside of it a little to appreciate how much time it's consuming. Judging other people. Uh, totally. uh, Judging everything. Absolutely. Uh, wanting. You know, how much time do we spend in this kind of. Well, the writer Eckhart Tolle has a beautiful. I'd like to make fun of Eckhart Tolle. But he's got a beautiful <laughs> phrase about the the background static of discontent. And that that it is just almost always there. We don't see it. Um, and it, when you start to see these things, it's incredible. I mean, the Buddhists use the term liberation, which is a grandiose term. Mm -hmm. They have to say there's some technical uh, connotations to the term when they use it. But this is, you know, this is a sort of liberation where you once you start to see these mental patterns, you are freeing yourself from them. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's not too strong a word, even if. If, you, if any of us ever achieve complete liberation, it's what's going on when you become more aware of the things that are pushing and pulling you and leading you to spend time wastefully and pathologically, and you do less of that. Yeah, and you know, I've you know, you you and I have both wrestled with this because you reveal. I mean, I think to a lesser extent, probably to your credit, in uh, in your book, some of some of your inner craziness, and you know, it does involve. I, it is anxiety producing, especially on my first book, to to you know, kind of put it all out there. But if you want to talk about the impact of meditation in an honest way and in a compelling way, you really have to put it all out there because that's what's happening in the course of meditation. Right. Um, that, you know, that that is the deal. Joseph Goldstein, the aforementioned Joseph Goldstein, this incredibly brilliant teacher who I have the good fortune to have as my teacher, has uh, <laughs> this great expression. He was meditating once with another brilliant writer on meditation, Dr. Mark Epstein, who's written a bunch of beautiful books about the overlap between psychology and Buddhism. And they opened their eyes and uh, he turned to Mark and said, the mind has no pride. And that is the truth. I mean, if you are, if you're awake enough to see your mental processes, it is incredibly embarrassing. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, as long as we're talking about your inner Robert Johnson, one thing that comes through in the course of the book is this way of thinking about yourself. Like there are these different voices in your head. There's the part that's him and is, and, and, and is prone to rage and, and paranoia. And then there's the part that's, that's obsessively planning or worrying beyond a point that is useful and so on. And, 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 and you develop, a, you talk about this way of uh, relating to them with awareness of them and not with hostility toward them, right? Uh, I mean, you actually develop names for them in your, in the, the inner Dan Harris is a, is a chorus of uh, people and you have names for them. Yes. So let me say a few words about this, but I'm going to turn the tables because as I was writing this, I was also reading your book, which I believe I read actually a couple of times, and it overlaps with this module, this idea of modularity that you talk about in your book. So let me say a few words, and maybe you can sort of amplify it if you don't mind uh, with with uh, the this idea, this view of the this modular idea of the mind. Um, so because we do it in sort of a less serious way, um, this actually comes from Jeff Warren, my co-author, who's a, a, this ph phenomenal meditation teacher from Canada, who I took on this bus trip across the country. Um, and made a lot of Canadian jokes in the process. Uh, he noticed, he sort of uh, diagnosed in me a real grim, eat your vegetables, baton death march, gulag esque uh, flavor to my meditation practice. A uh, grr, you know, you got to do it, but not a lot of joy in the process. Um, and he was right. And I had been vaguely aware of this. Um, 
but I didn't really want to face it. And uh, we identified that some, you know, that that I had this sort of voice, this inner meanness, a uh, 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 character that could sort of take over uh, for me. Uh, uh, Robert Johnson, my grandfather, who was kind of a nasty character, who I, one of my early memories of him. I don't actually tell the story in the book, but I have this clear memory of my grandfather, stern Yankee figure in Massachusetts. The, when I was a little boy, he, and my, my little brother and I, he got his first VCR, and I remember him taking us into the living room to show it to us, and he punctuated his little uh, show and tell with, if you touch it, I will break your arm. Uh, <laughs> that was, you know, he was talking to an eight and a seven-year-old. That was the kind of guy he was, and uh, interestingly, later in life, became very sweet. Um, and Jeff and I were talking one day about my inner Robert Johnson, which mostly was self-directed. Uh, would come out in self-laceration when I would get distracted during meditation, notwithstanding the fact that I was always lecturing people about the need to uh, start again and again and again in meditation, but also could be external too. You know, I, I retain the capacity to get a little, to be a little moody. And uh, we were talking about this one night on the bus. So the on the bus, we, we'd spend hours and hours on the bus uh, driving and driving and driving across country. And we'd have these long uh, confabs led by Jeff that were all just really genuinely for me, if nobody reads this book, I will have gotten so much out of it because of the time I got to spend in this little tin can with this master teacher. Um, and Jeff made a recommendation that I really resisted, which was he said, look, we all have neurotic programs that take over our consciousness uh, at various points during the day. Uh, so you have an inner Robert Johnson, but there are other uh, modes into which your mind will go. And why don't you, uh, he said, what I do, I, Jeff, I name them. I give them little names and I greet them with some friendliness rather than hostility every time. So he talked about one inner character of his being El Grandioso. <clears throat> this um, Jeff has struggled with insecurity as a consequence of uh, having ADHD most of his life, mm -hmm. which is a whole interesting other thing we could talk about because he's a meditation teacher who, would su who was suffering with imposter syndrome. And I, th I thought that idea was very cheesy and I didn't really like the idea of, you know, seeing these various neurotic programs arising and giving them names it just struck me as a little silly. But I, as I do, I pretty much reject every good idea the first time I hear it. And over time, I realized that the answer to unlocking some of the, the eat your vegetables, grin and bear it, or not grin and bear it, and nature to my practice was actually to introduce a level of inner congeni congeniality. So I started to name these inner programs. So there's Robert Johnson, there's Julie the Cruise director, who's kind of the inner logistician, always planning what's coming up. Uh, there's a character I called Sammy, uh, after the uh, novel What Makes Sammy Run, about a uh, really uh, sharp-elbowed um, uh, uh, entertainment uh, figure who is just maniacally ambitious, uh, because I definitely have a lot of that, and on and on. So maybe five or six characters that I see tend to take over the mind. And in, in, this is actually, in some ways, like a... Um, uh, uh, a version of what the Tibetans have been doing with these deities they've created. You know, the Tibetan Tibetan Buddhism, as I've, I've heard it described, is kind of the psychedelic version of regular Buddhism, where they create these deities uh, which can represent anger and other inner characters. Mm -hmm. And this is just a sort of a quirkier, more bespoke version of that. Uh, and I found it, for me, has been, notwithstanding a, a, the goofy veneer, has been a, a great way for me to create some distance to see the these modes with some distance and and not to take them so personally and over time not taking the contents of your own consciousness so personally that is another aspect of liberation but let me just stop talking and let you take over and add some uh, a, a little bit more um uh scientific uh uh, uh bona fides on top of this well, I, I would just say that this is what you're describing is very consistent uh, with a model of the human mind that has a lot of support in psychology, especially evolutionary psychology, called the modular model. That term is used in different ways. For present purposes, it just means that uh, the mind, uh, far from being this kind of like unified thing, consists of different parts that evolved possibly at different times for different things. <laughs> Uh, and, you know, sometimes it's said it's more like a Swiss Army knife than it's a general purpose. You know, it has different blades for different uh, 
functions and they take over at different times. And, and, and really extreme versions of that are things like jealousy when it's clear, like, whoa, that's just somebody else is in charge at this moment during yes. a jealous rage. But it's also true in subtler ways, you know, like this is the this is the one that worries about this kind of thing. And this is the one that is resentful, you know, of certain kinds of slides. This this one is, is resentful whenever uh, you feel that your status is 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 being given short shrift or something. Um, and uh, so, yeah, it's it's totally consistent. This idea that 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 uh, there's the different actors in your mind is almost literally the way it's viewed in, you know, by a lot of psychologists you know in reading your book I, the image that came to mind for me this is not a perfect analogy but uh the magic eight ball you ever know, play with a magic eight ball and 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 all these there it's this guy there's some disgusting liquid in there and then these different tiles come to the surface and that's the one that's visible at that moment forget what the tiles say because that's un disconnected to yeah. actually the pieces it's just that there are these different characters maybe in 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 the mind that are competing for salience uh and and when they do often with the strong ones like jealousy they can color everything right. and what people can learn through your book is the actual technique by which you start to have some control over which actor is in charge at which time and whether you follow the guidance of a given actor and it's it's shockingly simple and yet overlooked all the time by me at least and it's <laughs> the mechanism is always the same and it's mindfulness, which is just seeing clearly what's happening in any moment where you see clearly what's happening. You cannot be owned by it. And that is I mean, it may only last a nanosecond, but this is a infinitely renewable resource always available to you. I mean, uh, I just came back from a meditation retreat with Joseph Goldstein, where one of the many takeaways for me was, oh, yeah, this thing or no thing is always here. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just whether I want to make, uh, I want to avail myself of it. Yeah, uh, yeah. J John Kabat-Zinn, who famously started uh, mindfulness-based stress reduction and, and just put mindfulness in a completely non-Buddhist <clears throat> context and did a lot for the practice uh, by doing so and, yes. and uh, you know, kind of using it in this explicitly therapeutic way. He says mindfulness is simple, but not easy. It, right. it, the, the basic idea of what you're doing is simple, and 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 when you kind of uh, when you do it successfully, if I might use that word that is frowned on by certain <laughs> the word succeed is frowned on by certain meditation teachers for reasons. Well, we, we may get into, but in any event, um, when you do it, it feels like this shouldn't be hard, you know. But but it is. It's it's yes. it's hard to pers It's partly it's hard to persist in the practice that makes you reasonably good at it. And that's one place your, your book comes in. I mean, we're back to the many reasons you can either uh, not try to meditate in the first place or try it and fall off the wagon. The ego is the thinking mind is, and the more you see it, the more I see it clearly, the more diabolical it, 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 it reveals itself to me is, incredibly creative and relentless it knows you so well and it is so easy to get carried away because the thinking mind is great at carrying you away right well and you know when you think about it like in the morning when you think you get up some morning and you have like an excuse for not meditating that is They're... one of the actors <clears throat> yes it is <laughs> that's one of the actors talking yes. you know yes. don't listen yes. don't listen yes. One of the techniques for dealing with this, uh, again, I found this on my most, and we talk about it in the book, and I just saw it so clearly on my most, and I just got back like a, 10 days ago from this retreat, is mental noting, uh, which is um, just as things come up, you just, it's like you have this nonviolent machine gun in your head that's firing off words, whispers in the mind, where as that voice comes in to tell you, you know what, maybe today's not the day to meditate. It's just, psh, that's doubt. That's doubt. Mm -hmm. and is when, when you and it's like a little bit like a video game again i, I don't want to because it's not hostile you're not firing off the machine gun that i'm referencing in anger because that actually is just feeding the doubt it's just this kind of friendly nerf machine gun um so this is my wife in the background uh, bianca. Oh, bianca yes i've read about her 
Yes, she's in the book a lot. Um, hi. She's saying hi. Bianca. Hi, Bianca. <laughs> she's a little mad that we're doing the interview while the apartment's a mess. So that, well, maybe, that's not Maybe as a way of compensation, we should spend the rest of the time talking about her. Yeah, well, she's also hates being talked about, so that would be well, actually. Well, then we, I've forgotten her already. That will be what we do in exchange for her letting you do this. Is I've forgotten who you're married to. Yeah, Jane? well, we Jane. we uh, we we like to joke. There's only room for one narcissist in this marriage, um, and so uh, she is definitely not well, the one. You're filling that role admirably, Dan. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Uh, and by the way, I should just quickly add, you know, I haven't mentioned your podcast, the Ten Percent Happier Podcast. Fascinating conversation between you and your wife. Jane, I believe is her name. Yeah, Jane. Yeah. And uh, and also a conversation with Jeff Warren, the, the aforementioned yes. meditation teacher. Yep. And as long as we're plugging your your empire, there's the 10% Happier app. Yes. Can I just say a quick word about the app? Because yeah. actually the app is what it is, is sort of the inciting event for this whole book. Because I, I really wasn't that excited to write. I have in mind a book that I really – have long wanted to write, which is a true sequel to 10% Happier, where I investigate uh, the stuff that you're talking about in your book, uh, your most recent book, um, uh, Enlightenment, which is an idea that is really intriguing for me. Uh, but what uh, after I, I wrote 10% Happier, I, I got some feedback that was um, <clears throat> hard to take, but tr correct. I got a call one day from a, a name I think you'll recognize, Daniel Goldman, who wrote a, 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 a really a seminal book called Emotional Intelligence. He's a former New York Times science writer. Um, and he's in this sort of cabal known as the Jew booze that include Joseph Goldstein, Dr. Mark Epstein, Jack Kornfield, Sharon Salzberg, uh, Danny Goldman, Richie Davidson, these mostly New York area uh, born and bred uh, Jewish folks, really smart, uh, who went off and discovered meditation in India and Asia in the 60s and 70s and brought it back to the United States and helped popularize it. And Danny called me after 10% Happier came out and said, well, good for you for getting people excited about meditation, but you're not really doing that much to help them do the thing. And uh, even though I had included some instructions in the back of 10% Happier, but they were pretty quick. And so I actually, went, along with Joseph and Sharon, started this app called the 10% Happier app uh, where we teach people how to meditate. We bring in, I think one of our big sort of value adds is that we have these incredible teachers who don't, aren't like Joseph in particular is not very public facing. doesn't, you know, it's not, doesn't work with any other apps or anything like that where we bring them in and, and, and uh, you, a lot of the content on the app is you watch a quick clip of me chit chatting with a meditation teacher. It's fun and instruct and instructive. And then it rolls right into a guided audio meditation. And in the process of working on this app, we started uh, learning a lot from our customers and we developed this um, concept of the secret fears, the mm -hmm. secret. It's actually not the right terminology, but it was a terminology we were using the secret fears that stop people from meditating. And that was the germ of what grew into this book is that we, we, I wanted to really attack uh, all of the reasons why people aren't meditating in a systematic way. And in many ways, sort of make up for the one, maybe one of many, but definitely the one that comes to mind, big flaw of 10% Happier, which was I naively and kind of cavalierly assumed that anybody who read the book would want to meditate because I thought I made a good case. But as it turns out, I vastly underestimated the 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 difficulty of habit formation you know i talk about uh, this you'll hopefully i'm correct about this but i'm talking to the master here you know evolution did not evolution did not bequeath us a mind that is good for long term health planning evolution cared about threat detection and finding food and mates and therefore getting your dna into future generations it didn't care a lot about like making sure you brush your teeth and get enough exercise well, and I mean, also, the environment has changed in ways that make it more important that you brush your teeth. I mean, I mean, even the invention of agriculture, just wheat was bad for people's teeth to say nothing of uh, sugar. So it's I, I mean, it's definitely true. Natural selection doesn't care, certainly doesn't care how happy we are. Um, longevity mattered less during evolution because uh, it just wasn't going to wasn't likely to, you know, getting past 50 was such a rare thing anyway. So. Um, and, it, it, you know, yeah. D uh, and then the environment has, has gotten worse in all kinds of ways that complicate actual physical health and mental health. Yeah. So, yeah, 
so yeah, and evolution is not always our friend here, and and but it's our creator, and it and it's in a certain sense what you're ultimately coming to terms with when you investigate your mind is is what your creator imbued you with. Yes, I mean that's why that's one of the many sort of primordially pleasing things about why Buddhism is true, um, because the mind likes. I just see this over time with meditation. The mind likes aligning with what is true. Um, it just, even if it's harsh, you, you know, I, I, I heard this expression when I, I was on retreat recently, there was a teacher giving a Dharma talk at this retreat center where I was talking about death. And this is her phrase that people, the vast majority of human beings don't want to talk about death, but actually if you talk about it, frankly, there's something about it that the mind likes. And, uh, that is, that for me was true reading your book and hearing about our creator this impersonal creator of evolution uh, and and what it's left us with, there's something very pleasing about seeing the truth of that and then knowing <coughs> that there are hacks. Yeah, and we should say that you're, uh, you're going above and beyond the call of duty and joining us here because you actually have a cold, as was evinced by that last cough. And you should feel free to cough. I know you're used to like fancy studios where they have actual cough buttons. We forgot to send you the cough button by, by Federal Express, as we would have been happy to do. Had we, we have a... Uh, <clears throat> sorry. That's okay. I will entertain people while you're away, and if necessary, we'll actually cut this out. But I think first what we'll try is for me to juggle, entertain people by juggling. Oh, uh, sorry, we don't have time to start the juggling. Dan's back. Yeah, uh, we don't have cough buttons, we have editing. Uh, yeah, we we in extreme cases we have editing, but it has to be pretty extreme. You would have to you get violently have, ill. You don't have to edit that. I think it's good. Yeah, no, no. People love that kind of thing. Um, so, yeah, so, I mean, so there's so much in the book I want to talk about. So, I mean, first of all, your your aforementioned wife enters the book a little. I mean, there are characters in this book, and, and without doing a plot spoiler at the beginning of the book we see that you would like uh for your wife to take meditation more seriously than she's she's taking at that point we'll see you'll have to read the book to find out uh whether that indeed happens but this fascinating there's a number of characters your you, you, jeff warren as you said is fascinating and this guy's in the book and alexander hello alexander say hi i hear you going to a circus today alexander is that true it's one in the blue tent. In yeah, the blue tent. In the blue tent. Well, that's the best <coughs> one. I'm glad they're sending. I'm get, glad they're sending you to the best circus. Nothing but the best for you, buddy. All right, enjoy the circus. I yeah, fun, characters. Alexander. <clears throat> Look, there are a million books about meditation. Yeah. Uh, and by, the bar is high to write something new, and I'll, I'll, I like to joke that. There are no original ideas in any of either of my books. My only innovation is one, I tell stories, and two, and usually very embarrassing stories, and two, I use the word fuck a lot, and uh, and that really is just the, the the those are the innovations. Yeah, and by the way, that would help our viewership if you repeated that a few more times. Could you say that word a few more times? Uh, fuck. Yeah, that's one of my favorite words of all time. You know, Good. there's a whole book about that word that I haven't read. Yeah. Well, you don't but have to. You're a natural. Some people I, have to read that book. You you would not learn anything new. I am naturally profane. Why is that? Is that verboten? Should I not have said that? No, word? no, I'm not. I, no, I, I encourage you to say as often as possible. Okay. We, okay. we we broke that barrier long ago. We were okay. pioneers. <laughs> um, so uh, no, but it is the book. There, the, there is nothing like this book. There absolutely is nothing like this book. Um. And it was very smart of you to team up with this great meditation teacher and make him a character. And even by the end of the book, disclose actual tension between you and him, big time that happened as you were trying to write the book. And and I mean, I think uh, a big part of the success of both your previous book and and the the almost certain success of this book, I think, involves how honest you are about how imperfect you are. Um, I mean, you know, you do not purport to have attained enlightenment. And, and, you know, I think kind of like me, you, you say you, you know, you think you need meditation maybe even more than the average person. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, winding up somewhere short of perfection doesn't mean you haven't come a long way. No, I think 10% is, 
uh, that, that idea is a form of liberation too. You know, we, as type A people, we, um, we want to win, uh, whatever we do. And it's very useful and very comforting to know that just because you've started meditating doesn't mean you aren't going to be an asshole on the regular. And I am all the time, you know, and, uh, for example, I forgot to warn my wife about this interview. So she, she could get rid of the clutter. And so she leaves for the circus with my son now annoyed at me. And <clears throat> I do that, that type of shit all the time. What so an asshole, man. I know. I know. And it gets worse. It gets worse. And that's the mindful version of you. Uh huh. You, you, I mean, the pre mindful version of me was you, you, in the region. You would have intentionally of, left things on the floor. You would have added to the clutter and then started yes, the taping. It, it would, I would have enjoyed her suffering. It was definitely in the region, in the sort of neighborhood, in the jurisdiction of Attila the Hun. Uh, but, but, but just to, to your point, you know, there's a, about the sort of the story, uh, telling thing there's, are you familiar with the, the comedian Dave Chappelle? Yeah. He's a, a hero of mine. And yeah. I just loved, 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 I think his show in the mid aughts was probably the best television show ever made is just unbelievable distilled brilliance. And he has an episode where they take, they use outtakes and he has a shtick at the beginning of this episode about how. African Americans in the South back in the day, uh, they were so poor that they <clears throat> they didn't get the good parts of the pig to eat. They got the snout, and they had to learn how to make good stuff out of the snout. And for me, that is just the guiding principle of when I'm writing a book. Like so many things went wrong on this road trip. We almost killed each other. Not just we had there were there was internal fighting there was jeff and i in the writing of the book almost killed each other and for me that's snout we could just make good stuff out of the snout and uh, always being attracted to that and not trying to create some pretty rosy picture because i think it's really a relief to people once they realize that perfection is not attainable it's not what's off on offer right. here it is just relating to life's vexations and vicissitudes in a more su supple way that is what is on offer. And right. maybe apologizing more quickly. Right. And meditation won't always feel like a huge success. But it always is practice, literally. I mean, you're, yes. you're always yes. practicing. Even yes. when you're when it feels like failure, that's practice. Uh, I actually am of the view that often the bad sits yeah. are the, the most impactful, like a hard workout. Yeah. Uh, because you're really in it. With the good ones, uh, what a good... Uh, you may actually feel like it was good. You you might be you might have been completely distracted and lost in a pleasant fantasy in the whole time, and therefore you thought it was good. Yeah. So you uh, on this issue of how demanding should you be of yourself in terms of sustaining <clears throat> your practice? You adopt, I would say, a pretty lenient, in a certain sense, stance in the book. And and I'm wondering if you kind of struggled with how severe to be, right? I mean, there are the people who say, look, you should do 40 minutes every morning, and if you don't, you screwed up, and you shouldn't settle for less. You're almost at the opposite end of the spectrum. There is such a thing as a one-minute sit, and, and, and why don't you talk through kind of the logic of your position on this? You know, it taps into something that I know you've wrestled with a little bit, too, is that there is... Um, there's been a backlash to the popularization of mindfulness among traditional Buddhists, uh, which I think is not entirely unjustified, frankly. Um, but, and, and I say this as somebody who considers himself in many ways to be a traditional Buddhist. Um, I am of the view, however, that more mindfulness is better than less mindfulness and that it is just demonstrably true that when you set the bar higher, most people won't bother to jump. And uh, <clears throat> I'm an unabashed evangelist and popularizer. I am trying to make the bar as low as possible for people to get dip their toe into the water, into the shallow end of the pool. Because some of them may go to the deep end, but staying in the shallow end, if that's all that ever happens with one minute daily-ish, that's the bar we set. One minute of meditation daily-ish is the bar we set. And for, for if that is all people do, even if it's just for a few weeks, but just say they do it you know, for a few years or the rest of their life, that bit of mindfulness is so much better than no mindfulness. Right. Waking up to the thunderous truism that you have a mind in our thinking, again, just can change your behavior by, not, by having you not be so yanked around by your urges, impulses, and emotions. And 
to me, that is that is the the important thing. And um, I also did a lot of a lot. I did a reasonable amount of research into uh, behavior change science, the science around habit formation. And, you know, it, it, it that's where you really see that we are not wired as homo sapiens sapiens uh, for success in adopting long term healthy habits. And so if you want to get people on the road toward adopting this habit, you have to understand that we resist this. Uh, we resist it even when we know it's good for us, and perhaps even especially when we know it's good for us. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just trying to create a stance. It's like there's a great um, thing that I once saw Elaine on Seinfeld talking about uh, how she deals with skittish men. Uh, it's like she said it was like trying to you know attract a squirrel in Central Park. You know, you hold the the, you hold your hand out with the nut in your hand and there's no big movements, you know, and, and that's the way I feel when talking to people who are kind of sniffing around meditation. You just want to make it as user friendly as possible. And it often, once people get in the door, they do slip very seamlessly once they go from extrinsic motivation, doing it because the scientists are telling them they should, to intrinsic motivation. Once they get a taste of the, uh, the chocolate, as the Buddhists say, then they're on their way. And you just, my job is, is a gateway drug to get them on their way. Right. And, you know, the thing about a one-minute sit is, um, I mean, I heard a kind of a related thing from somebody who once <clears throat> said, uh, your rule should be every day your butt hits the cushion, period. That can be all. That can be all that happens. Then you get right back up. Um and a couple of a couple of virtues of, of taking, you know, accepting that you'll just do one minute some days. One is that you keep the string intact. And then maybe the next day you'll feel you have more time and you'll do more. The other is sometimes you sit down and you say, I'm just going to sit for a minute. And you go, you know, this feels okay. And I probably do have time to do a little more of it. And you actually you actually get into it. Now, another thing you, you – did you want to say something? Or No, I was just agreeing with you. Yeah, okay. I mean, another thing you emphasize is uh, – Carrying meditation into the day off the cushion. Yeah, I mean, you you have specific exercises you call what free range uh, meditation or something. Mm -hmm. So so you talk about how specific kinds of activities can be, you know, how to direct your attention during specific kinds of activities to make them kind of meditative and so on. Um, but that's it. Seems to me that like that's a a big part of the payoff is carrying it off the cushion, right? Right. We we don't. Uh, as <clears throat> the brilliant meditation sh teacher Sharon Salzberg has said, you don't meditate to be a better meditator. You meditate to be better at the rest of your life, or as I would say, to be less of an asshole to yourself and others. And that's the point. Uh, and carrying it through the rest of your day is is the point. All of a sudden, these moments that we use to suffer, waiting online, waiting for an elevator, waiting for our computer to boot up, uh, we can actually use to tune in to whatever is happening. Uh, and uh, it, this starts to change your actual life. Not your life as you imagine it, but your life as you live it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, just the other day I was at a party and uh, like I really wanted to hit the dessert table. So I started walking over there and I was intercepted by somebody I know who's very long-winded. And I like didn't want to be rude. Like I really felt the urge. Like I really wanted the dessert. And I and what I was able to do because I meditate was actually look them in the eye as if I was very interested in what they were saying and just observe the urge for the dessert mindfully, which kind of takes the sting out of it. And it wasn't a major triumph, but I, I didn't have to feel guilty about having been rude, you know, and like ending the conversation before the person wanted to end it. This may seem like a small triumph, but the point is... This is, there's a, a wide variety of circumstance. I mean, the mo more extreme are when you're going to actually scream at somebody, right? Yes, 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 yes. And uh, Jeff Warren, he has this idea of uh, riding the urge. Uh, he, he talks about this in a very good way. And the book is interspersed with his very good ways of talking about these various things. But... Um, can I can I say something about that moment that you sort of yeah. uh, demonstrated as not being that big of a deal? But I actually think this is since we established the motif of liberation early on. Let me let me continue to work it work it. Um, 
liberating in two very meaningful ways. One is uh, we are so often, so often just completely owned by our desires, you know, and, uh, you know, they, they, they become compulsions, they become obsessions, but actually they're just little pulses in the mind if you look at them. And it is incredibly liberating to watch a desire pass that that urge to go to the to the dessert table starts as this little invisible pulse that as my as Joseph would say is little more than nothing mm-hmm. in the mind and it becomes locomotion and but actually if you're awake enough to catch it you can see it pass and what does it taste like when it's gone that tastes like freedom yeah. frankly because you see oh this thing that seems like a monolith is just just a passing nothing uh, so one, two, the other liberating thing about it is we tend to blame ourselves for what we feel. There's a great way for the ego to tell a whole story about what an asshole Bob is for not wanting to talk to this well-intentioned person who just needs a little bit of care and feeding, like a ficus that needs to be watered, a uh, little attention because they want to say something to you probably for reasons of affirmation that they're looking for. And stingy Robert won't give it to him or her and because he's focused on his chocolate obsession or his little white uh, 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 powdery donut. No, it's, uh, the cho- it's the chocolate actually in this case. In this Go case, the, the chocolate, some right? Some days but, it's donuts, some days it's chocolate. And, and, and no judgment here. Um, and, and, and the whole story arises about what a bad person you are, which of course just reinforces the idea of Robert. Uh, and what I, the, the Buddhists have a great expression for this. Second arrow, <clears throat> just a, I don't know the exact parable, but it basically had a guy w- walking through the woods one day and he gets hit by an arrow. Back in the day, I guess there were arrows flying. And uh, so you, there's the pain and insult of the arrow be, uh, piercing your flesh. But then there's the second arrow of why am I always the guy who gets hit by the arrow? Now I'm not going to make it to dinner tonight, blah, blah, blah. That's the second arrow mm-hmm. that we insert voluntarily and we do it all the time. It's not your fault. You don't know where the desire for dessert came from. The mind is a mystery. It's a void. We don't know where this shit comes from. But you you describe the second arrow that you were able to not really insert so violently because you were mindful. Mm-hmm. Now, this leads us back to something we touched on a little, but the idea of, you know, once you have acquainted yourself with the various players that constitute your mental life, taking a kind of a friendly attitude toward them, which isn't to say you're accepting the things they want by any means. In fact, you're you're liberating yourself from their dictates, but you emphasize, and maybe this is Jeff Warren's term, uh, friendly, I I don't know, but... but, uh, the, having a friendly attitude toward them. And I want to <clears throat> emphasize to people that I can hear some people right now kind of saying, oh, this is just, this is exactly the stereotype of, of like, you know, new age mush that, that I fear, right? It's like, oh, be a little kinder to yourself. And I want to emphasize that both you and I are people who did not, in your book, I remember you say, okay, so I tried this loving kindness meditation, which involves being kind to yourself as a starting yeah. point. Yes. And, you, and you're kind of like, I forget, but it's kind of like, well, maybe I was in a hurry. It wasn't a bad. It, it, the sense is that it didn't really stick. I say basically the same thing in my book. I, I'm not, I'm not, I don't, that, it doesn't naturally work for me. And I really have not totally yet bought into the idea of being kind to myself or loving myself. I really haven't. That said, I think both you and I are sold on how ultimately, you know, directing harsh judgment toward yourself it tends to be self-defeating. And I'm not the kind of person I'd expect to say that is what I'm trying to say, and neither are you. Right. So this was the big lesson I learned in the book personally, why this book will have been worth it even if it's an utter failure and embarrassment. Because <clears throat> uh, we were discussing before Jeff's accurate diagnosis of my practice of having a, a death march flavor to it. And... I was a huge hypocrite. I was walking around telling people that the game of meditation is noticing you've become distracted and good naturedly escorting your attention back to your primary object of focus, usually your breath. Um, But I was not doing that. And when you are 
excessively applying the internal cattle prod, which is what can make us so successful in our lives in many ways, in our professional lives. It gums up the works. It diminishes your resilience. Uh, it it uh, diminishes your resolve. Uh, it bogs you down. It, it becomes you in endless loops of doubt uh, and actually introducing every meditation teacher talks about <clears throat> having a flavor of self-compassion or loving kindness in your own practice. And I have disregarded it for years. But when Jeff talked about it, just in terms of a simple flavor of friendliness, even toward yourself, toward all of these dramatis personae that come up, these modes, to put it in the sort of modular way that you've talked about it, just seeing that with some friendliness <laughs> makes the whole thing go more smoothly. It's like a, it's this weird video game where you can't make any progress if you want too badly to make progress. And uh, you're, you know, self-flagellating in order to get better, which is, of course, what we do all the time mm -hmm. when we're going through business school or law school or college or trying to uh, get better at our work. Uh, but in fact, that is in meditation, self-defeating. And in fact, what I've learned is that actually taking the attitude of having some inner friendliness into the rest of my life has actually made me much better at the things I've been trying to do all along. Right. So that leads us to this question you address explicitly in the book. You know, you look at common fears people have about meditating, common questions. One of them is, will I lose my edge? And I mean, to, to, to really examine that in crystalline form, you actually go talk to cops. Yeah. about meditation and and so on but but talk a little more it's not an unreasonable fear no and, and i don't in a certain sense i don't think it's totally unfounded i mean there's certain uh competitive obsessions that you may see diminish uh and it may be a result of a change in your value system like uh, i've decided that making the most as much money as i can is not the most important thing but that's separate from saying you've lost your edge that you're no longer doing things well. Um, anyway, I, anyway, as I, I leave leave my views on this aside. Just talk about. I mean, you're you're the perfect person to talk about it because you you do more than any human could expect to do. I mean, to have written this book and gone on this tour uh, in a very short period of time. It all happened in about a year, right? Yeah. yeah. And while uh, <laughs> you didn't take any kind of extended vacation, did you really from no. your work? No. And, and you're working, like we said, at least six days a week. So talk about this losing your edge thing that does not seem to have happened to you. Well, um, there are cul-de-sacs. There are pitfalls uh, where you can lapse into passivity or resignation. But that is to misread what the point of mindfulness is. <clears throat> you know, look, the Buddha was very ambitious. He was really proud of having built his whole of this whole. Um, by the way, he didn't call it Buddhism. Oh, the English scholars who developed discovered his writings in the 1800s they coined that term. He 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 just called it the Dharma, uh, the the law. Um, he was very proud of uh, what he'd built uh, in terms of a philosophical and practical foundation of these cadre of nuns, monks and nuns. He hung out with kings and merchants. Um, so the Buddha was not anti, uh, uh, success. In fact, in, in the eightfold path, right livelihood is right there. Um, my, my, I remember when I first started meditating, my dad, who's a, uh, was until recently a very hard charging, um, academic physician in Boston, um, said that, uh, he knew a few people had gotten into Buddhism and it had made them quote, like totally ineffective. Um, and you know, I, I get it. You know, he was the one he had, he had, uh, given me this motto, which was the price of security is insecurity, which I had really taken to heart. I believe that, uh, any success I achieved was directly correlated to the intensity of my anxiety loop. What meditation has helped me do is to see that there is a line. It's a wavy and blurry line and there's no, there's no scientific way to figure out when you've crossed it other than just mindfulness, self-awareness, intuition. But there is a line between useless rumination, 
resiliency degrading rumination and what I call constructive anguish. And the certain, if you want to do something great, a certain amount of stress is actually part of the deal. You want plotting and planning and worrying and uh, pacing around and trying to, you know, this book took a lot of that. But no, having the wherewithal, the self-awareness <clears throat> to see when uh, it doesn't make any sense anymore, it is not useful, is what makes you 10 times more effective in the end. Right. And you are a living testament. <clears throat> and we are, uh, so we're about, we're at the one hour mark where we typically uh, typically stop. Is there anything else you want to say about the book? Uh, no. <clears throat> uh, I do a lot of interviews and with the ex notable exception of you, because when, when I interviewed you on the podcast, I had read your book uh, several times. But often I do interviews and I, uh, uh, frankly, I haven't had a chance to read the book. So just being interviewed now by you, I just really appreciate the careful read and the thoughtful questions. It's uh, it just, you know, it's meaningful to me. So thank you. Well, it's an easy thing to read. That's the and, and this was true of your first book. I mean, it was uh, I think I said about your first book. It's as close. If there's such a thing as a book about meditation, that's a page turner. This is it. And, you, you know, it, it had this natural narrative arc. And uh this does too, and it was more challenging, if anything, to do it in this case, but it has a narrative arc. It has your sense of humor too, which was very evident in the first book, and I think uh, partly responsible for its uh, success. And then embedded in that is, uh, a, a, you know, a, a substance that I don't think exists anywhere else in terms of the specific, you know, addressing of the reasons people don't meditate and the hindrances they encounter when they try to meditate, uh, I'm not aware of anything that um, that addresses as big a variety of these things, um, and and is is thus useful to as uh, as many different people as as this book. So that is the book, uh, Meditation for Fidgety Skeptics by Dan Harris. Um, and then there's the app, Ten Percent Happier. Uh, there's the podcast, Ten Percent Happier. And this itself is apparently a 10% happier how-to book, it says. Yeah. So the impact continues yeah. to expand. Yeah, I'm d doing my best. Doing my, I got a three-year-old to feed, so you know. No signs of losing your edge. <laughs> Not yet. So, um, uh, and then where do we find you on Twitter? At Dan B. Harris. Okay. All right. Well, th thanks, Dan. Uh, sorry you. you've got a cold. You, you soldiered on admirably, and we appreciate it. Thank you for putting up with it. My pleasure.